Good morning. Uh, Anthea Butler in Philadelphia and Peter Larman here in Los Angeles say hello, Anthea. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. That's good. I'm doing okay. Despite the slick and the drizzle here, we're going to be just fine. Absolutely. And we're going to have a, a, a review today <laughs> of some phobias that are sweeping our country and um, causing a little bit of inanity here and there. And we're going to go deep on phobia a little bit. I mean, I think we ought to simply begin with a certain amount of sex panic about the Supreme Court nominee, don't you? Oh, absolutely. What What is it about a single woman that makes everybody panic? Nobody can figure out who she's having sex with. we got to figure out how we're going to match her up. It's ridiculous. Uh, it, it is kind of ridiculous, but it really spiked, and I don't think for some it's gone away yet. Now, of course, they'll turn to her administration of the uh, Harvard Law School, but um, but I thought Maureen Dodd was hilarious in, uh, in uh, portraying uh, Professor Kagan, uh, Solicitor General, uh, General Kagan, as a hot babe always on the prowl for hot men and someone who never watches Rachel Maddow under any circumstance. Not, not at all. But, you know, what's, what's fascinating to me is that all of these sorts of notions about single women or what women are doing are embedded in these kinds of, you know, crazy religious traditions, right? And we've got this, even the media has an underlying sense in which they decide how they're going to vet someone by whether they're married or not, what's their sexual orientation, and all of these things have a religious connotation. So where they try to pretend that, oh, we're not thinking about all these things, the reality is, is that they care. They want to get in bed with everybody. Why is it that we're in so many people's beds? Who cares? I don't want to be in a Supreme Court justice nominee's bed. Yeah, uh, maybe actually um, a way of, of dealing with this phobia and tamping it down a little bit would be to have um, what they called in the 18th century a panopticon for yeah. people who might ever serve in government, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sort of 24-7 <laughs> spying from all angles. Don't you think that would work? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, this is actually, you know, sidebar, Philadelphia is the place where that panopticon happened with the um, East Eastern prison over here. So that was like we could watch the prisoners and see what they're doing. So maybe we just need to put everybody in a cage before you can be nominated to the Supreme Court so we can watch you 24-7, like a reality show, right? I mean, I don't mean to be flip about this, but I do think there's a sense in which, I mean, nobody asked this about, you know, all the married men, except, you know, of course, with Clarence Thomas, there was a whole other thing that happened with him. And, um, Getting yeah, right. exactly. So his sexuality got put on trial in a whole different kind of way. But I do think it is, you know, slightly troubling to watch people like Family Research Council and others try to figure out, you know, is she gay, is she not gay, how is she going to be on these issues, and use that, you know, vet her on the basis of whether she's, you know, and has a partner or not. Yes, and, and this will dare not speak its name in the hearings, but you can bet it'll be in the room. Oh, you better believe it, and you better believe you it. You almost wish you almost wish that they that they that they, that they, that they would speak it openly. Yeah, you see what I mean? Because the absurdity of it would, would then come clear. Exactly, exactly, and I think it's one of the things America public needs to see. I mean, when we start asking these questions out loud, how how does it really sound? How does it look? And and I'm wondering, you know, in these private go around and meet sessions, it it seems to me that the questions that will probably be asked privately will be those kinds of questions where people can get away with those kind of things. It's, it's sort of like an employment um, interview, right? Do they have the same kind of rules that we would have if we were hiring an employee? I, I don't think so. I think anything is probably fair game in those private conversations, don't you think? You bet. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. Um, anyway, we got a little bit of uh, similar sex panic in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, of all places, in regard to a dean for Marquette University, our our colleague, Mary Hunt, had a wonderful piece in Religion Dispatches yeah. this morning about the withdrawal of an offer. I think her name is O'Brien. Exactly. And um, interesting that the aging president of Marquette, um, I believe he would be a Jesuit priest, wouldn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah. He yeah. Uh, I heard him on, uh, happened to be in Wisconsin, and I heard him on television saying this has absolutely nothing to do with her sexuality or with academic freedom or with any pressure from the uh, church hierarchy. Uh, 
out. So, of course, that left open the question of, so what is it again? Yeah, exactly. A, a what is it again? And B, are you going to pay me since you withdrew the offer? I mean, what I would love to know is that they already sent her out, a, that they sent her out an offer letter and then they withdrew the offer. That would be very interesting to know. But I think you know, this this panic, this this withdrawing of the offer, I mean, everybody knew on the table what she had written. Everybody knew she was a lesbian. I mean, why is it okay to be a lesbian at one Jesuit institution and not be okay to be a lesbian at another Jesuit institution, right? Now, mm-hmm. you know, the, the question is for me is that, you know, where does Marquette see themselves and are they saying we're to the right of Seattle or, or not? That's the, that's the first thing. And the second is what does that mean for faculty there who are, you know, uh, homosexual or lesbian? What, what does that mean for them? Because obviously this is giving a very big message to whoever's presently at Marquette, who is LBGT population. So I, I, I wonder about that, first of all. And then secondarily, I mean, you know, Jesuit institutions have to face a very big problem right now, which is how many Jesuits are you going to have to run these places? At the end of the day, you can't find people to be to be deans, let alone presidents. They're running out of people who, who are uh, able to be, you know, to run the institutions per se. Georgetown is already headed by, a, you know, someone who's not a Jesuit. Uh, Loyola Marymount, where I used to teach, is, you know, just um, their president just stepped down. They're looking for a new president. Is that going to be a Jesuit priest or not? So I think this question is is an even bigger question than just them you know, um, doing this awful thing of rescinding an offer. It's about what is the future of these institutions when they don't even have the people in their own orders to run them, first of all. And then secondly, how do you have so much rampant homophobia? And, you know, some people are going to get upset with me about this, but duh, I mean, look around the average Catholic institution or order right now. Everybody's in the damn closet. So the question becomes, how are you going to deal with this in the future? And if they're going to go to the right this far, what, is it, what does it mean in terms of the kinds of students that they are going to be able to uh, attract, first of all? And second, what does it do, do to them in terms of accreditation? Well, it's, uh, it's kind of tragic because uh, Marquette is a great school and aspiring to yeah. still more greatness, and I think this is going to really throw them for a big loop. Just sorry to say that. Yeah. Um, let's uh, let's zero in a little bit on uh, phobia directed at oneself uh, and the strange ways in which that uh, works its way through. I'm doing a little review of the news here. What about that uh, evangelist George Reckers? <laughs> Is that, is, that, you know, is that not is that not an outstanding case oh, you know, of somebody who is uh, uh, internally divided? Well, it's it, it definitely divided and definitely phobic about their own sexuality. I mean, come on now. I mean, who gets somebody to carry their luggage from rentboy.com, okay? I mean, I've had problems with luggage before, but I mean, you get the $3 luggage card, right? And, and, <laughs> you know, a lot cheaper. Boy, that's a little <laughs> Expensive, right. but you know, right. but, but the thing is about this is the the phobia. The, so you know, records. I mean, what's awful about records is, is that he's saying, "No, um, you know, pay me to tell to tell you how come um, gay parents can't adopt kids in Florida." And he did the same thing, I believe, in Alabama. But it's he's a, an expert. Yeah, he's an expert, right? So he's an, right. he's an expert because he's fighting his own urges. So that's the first thing. Okay, so like he would say that up front, that would be okay. And the second thing is, is that why is it? I mean, if we think about Wreckers, Haggard, all of these people who are, you know, either a sort of, um, how should we put it, right-wing Christians, okay? But they're very much talking about, you know, how homosexuality is bad. And, and then, poof, all of a sudden, they're having to go pay for it. And they're and they're going out to do these things. What does that say about the depth of the um, the bifurcatedness of themselves and their own phobia against being able to be who they are? And I, I it's it's just been funny to me. The jokes have been great, but what I think is a deeper sort of um, I don't want to put the word this this sense of it's almost like Du Bois double consciousness in in, in a way, but in a very different way. You know, I thought about that in yeah. a different way, but 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 there's something there's something like that, and you know this is so old school. I yeah. had thought that um, you know this is a familiar pattern from the fifties and sixties. Mm-hmm, exactly. I had thought that um, people were able to uh, work their way through a middle path, and apparently that's not the case for these people who are who are so deep 
in their internalized closets. Well, don't you think that the phobias, though, are really like 50s and 60s sexual phobias? I mean, I, I, I'm surprised that Records didn't decide to sign himself up for one of these places where he could get, you know, get cured of his homosexuality. Or, I, you know, I could even see him, you know, submitting to shock therapy or something. That might be next. Yeah, that I mean, it may, be, it may be the next thing for him to do. I mean, that's the same thing they did with Haggard. It's like, you know, go and do these other things. But what I find is interesting, the difference between Haggard and Records is that Haggard can't he he says I'm not I'm not gay but I'm not sure where I am he's in a, in a different kind of nebulous place and I think that's very interesting in the way he talks about his sexuality vis-a-vis right. somebody like a records who says I am not this but the the bigger implication is is this I'm wondering if and, and you might want to say something about this if all of these communities are are sort of locked in to this mindset about what 50 sexuality is like, and they're living in the 21st century. In other words, everything is based on, you know, the happy, you know, the happy um, marriage, all of these things. But how is it that somebody like Records could walk around, go get Red Boy? And nobody's asking him, like they're asking Elena Kagan, why aren't you married? You know? This is the question oh, well. for me. Oh, well, now, now you're touching on something that uh – a great gulf fixed in terms of uh, yeah mm-hmm. expectations. And yeah. Standards. Oh dear. Yeah. I mean, this is a thing. I mean, why why not ask records? Why don't you have a wife? Where's your wife? You know. <laughs> I mean, I mean. Well, he's too busy doing the Lord's work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's too busy doing some heavy lifting. I think. <laughs> let's uh, let's change it up a little bit. Um, we're getting to some of the uh, uh, still more ominous phobias. Uh, I mentioned I was in Wisconsin, and um, I actually grew up in a in a hamlet full of Dutch Calvinists called Oostburg, Wisconsin, in Sheboygan County. Oh my gosh! Uh, not terribly surprising to me, but but horribly surprising to the uh, people involved. Um, there's a school outside of this village that uh, used to be called the Harmony School. It was a one room schoolhouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, the irony of the name Harmony apparently lost on everyone. Anyway, it was purchased by a Muslim. Uh, with the intention of creating a worshiping space. Muslims mm-hmm. in eastern Wisconsin now have a choice of driving 150 miles in either direction to, to uh, worship. When this became known to the, um, to the uh, pastors in my hometown, they went nuts. They went completely nuts. And um, it's a huge news in the Midwest, all over the Midwest, yeah. that they're trying to block these people from purchasing this property. Uh, and the kinds of things that are said... The kinds of things that are said about well, they'll bring arms to the um, to their worship service. Uh, we couldn't have that. They have multiple wives. I heard that from a, a neighbor of my mother's. Um, but also that uh, you know these people are essentially fascists, right? And, and the dominies. <laughs> sounds like a tea party to me. The, <laughs> the dominies have to import experts on Islamofascism uh, to keep these flames going. What the heck? I mean, I actually had to have a conversation with a couple of my mom's uh, friends and neighbors to say they don't have multiple wives, Yeah. right? Uh, uh, these people are, after all, living in eastern Wisconsin. They're mostly doctors, you yeah. know, doctors, dentists, uh, attorneys, not exactly um, people who just, uh, you know, dropped in from Pashtun. Um, but but it, it seems to be not amenable to reasonable argument. No, no. I, you know, it's it's the it's the kind of fear-based phobia. I mean, this is sort of the, you know, I, not to, I'm sure everybody out here is going to say you're blaming Bush again, but um, this is the holdover from the last, you know, the previous administration, I think, in part. Now, you know, I come from, I was born in a state where it's okay for you to carry a concealed weapon and take a gun into church, okay? I'm from Texas. If you're a white Christian. Yeah, yeah so if you're Christian. a white Christian or a black Christian. Well, white Christian. How about a white yeah, Christian? A white Christian, even. I don't even think they want black Christians taking guns into church. <laughs> I don't think Happens, way, okay, right? but yeah. um, it, it's the kind of craziness that that happens when you have another kind of a group that's not your own group, white Anglo-Saxon, you know, good Christian Protestant, you know, quote unquote, coming coming in, and it's it, it's a ridiculous because half these people know already that if if you're Muslim in this country, you're already probably under some kind of scrutiny one way or the other. So what what makes them think they're going to bring guns in? First of all, it's it's, it's ridiculous, and then secondly. The, the issue becomes, if anybody else had come in, would they do this if it was a you know an African-American group buying it for a Baptist church or, let's say, Nation of Islam or something? I imagine it would be the same right. kinds of same kinds of things. But what what's more troubling about this, I think, is that the, the kinds of 
things that are imposed upon this group. And everything you just said to me sounds like the same stuff Tea Party people have been doing. Or, you know, you think about that um, right-wing Christian group that just got arrested, the Hutari, last, about a month and a half ago right. in, in Michigan. Right. These are the same things that militia groups have been doing. So why is it all of a sudden it's upsetting that it's, 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 it's somebody who's coming in so that we can have a mosque and a place to worship so we don't have to drive an hour and a half away? So what, what, what's interesting to me about the phobias, and, and I'd be, I, I want to hear what you have to say about this. What's interesting about the phobias is that every time the, the same kind of standard is not placed on somebody who's, who's white. Anybody, a person of color, gets all these sorts of things put on them. But when it's somebody white doing these exact same things, you know, carrying guns, um, speaking out fast, you know, doing fascist statements about how, you know, the government's bad and all this other stuff. It's it's some kind of thing that we that the phobia gets shifted onto anybody who has some melanin in their skin, and this can't possibly be about anybody white. So it's it's two is things. This, uh, is this about the uh, possibly about the tipping point that uh, that is uh, approaching? I mean, in California, obviously, for a long time, the yeah. vast majority of, uh, of people uh, arriving here, people being born here, are mm-hmm. people of color. That yeah. hasn't happened in the in the in the core of the Midwest. Um, it's so interesting to me that um, Eastern Wisconsin, which uh, uh, when I was a kid there was pretty much lily white. I mean, mm-hmm. I didn't, you know, you had to go to Chicago really to find significant numbers of people of color. Um, Sheboygan County even has lots of of uh, people from uh, Mexico, Hmong, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I think people, you know, people are. Are, are the white people are polite in a kind of thin-lipped way yeah, yeah. toward these people they consider to be newcomers. Mm-hmm. But they're not really accepted. Deep down, they're not accepted as um, entitled to be there. No, no. And and the other thing part about it is is that it's, it's as though everybody woke up and they had this, you know, profound sense of, oh, my God, we're being taken over, right? When, when people like this have sort of been around for years, you know, there may have been a trickle at first. But now as the population has increased and, let's say, um, economic problems have ensued and people have lost their jobs, you have to look for the scapegoat, right? And in some kind of way, these are the people who are doing it. So whether their religion is different, their skin color is different, they wear some different clothes, all of a sudden these, you know, the dominant ranks close, you know, and I mean dominant not in numbers, but in, in thinking, right? Because right, it's in the old hierarchical sense of uh-huh. who's on top. yeah, it's exactly. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the, it's the exact problem we've had from from the moment that you know President Obama took office, and and, and people are going to say you're saying this because you're a black person. I'm like, no, I'm not. It could have been you know a, a Latino, it could have been an Asian. Everybody, all the rest of the people would have the same response, which is, oh my God, my people are now on the bottom of the totem pole. And so I'm wondering if your folks, if the folks in Sheboygan are sort of thinking, this is, you know, this is our last stand. This is the last hurrah because the world is changing. And the world around us, we can see those changes on television. But once it happens in your neighborhood, you know, it's it's not so Sesame Street anymore. It's not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, right? It's, a, right. it's some other that, kind that, of thing. That was cool. That yeah, was cool. Exactly. But actually having to encounter people in the public square is not so cool. Well, yeah. And I, you know, I kind of wonder, and, and maybe you can speak to this a little bit, because these are, this is the area of the country you're from. I, I've been, I, I, with all of these phobias, what I've really gotten a sense of when I, when I listen and I've been watching people and, and reading a lot of these blog posts talking about these things, is that a sense of normalized uh, Christianity, in other words, do unto others that you would have them do unto you, the golden rule, you know, all of this kind of things. It's, it's, not, it's not there anymore. There's, there's, there's Christianity has become distorted in such a way that where you look at these good church-going people who would normally, you know, maybe say even 20 years ago, would have been, you know, very cordial to these folks that said, you know, let's be welcoming to the stranger in our midst, all these things. Now it's become a hard line, and it can't happen anymore. Well, I actually talked to some clergy there, including my mother's minister, and mm-hmm. said, uh, so are there any good actors in this, religious good actors, who are uh, raising the right questions? And apparently it's at the level of internal discussions, but the, the you know, the, the uh, inclusive uh, religious leaders haven't uh, gone public with that message. If you don't go mm-hmm. public with it, um, you might as well not even have the conversation. In terms Do you think that's about fear You've for them? Step out on that. Do you think it's about fear? No? I, well, I think they're worried that they've got people in their congregations who probably agree with the, uh, you know, the hard line. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And you know how that goes, right? Yeah, exactly. You, know, you gotta have the. You like, gotta this have is your a partners. delicate subject. Yeah, very delicate very, subject. Very Let's delicate. Wait for it to go away, and then we'll then we'll take a position. Yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> definitely. But it's, it, it saddens me, though. You know, I, I keep thinking, yeah. you know, if nothing else, you could everybody could rally around in Wisconsin is you know the cheeseheads and be for the Green Bay Packers. But I suppose, um, and this is probably worth bearing worth mention. Maybe what the um, the group that's trying to buy this Harmony Church should do. Is to allow the new Miss USA to come, who is a, a Muslima, right? Uh, you know, right, right. and maybe that right would help out. Michigan, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. But you know, of course, they're already looking at her because you know, they're like, oh, we got to find out these stripper pictures, all this other stuff. I just like, here we go. It's the same thing that happened with Vanessa Williams, right? When you get the first right. one, we got to find something wrong, right? So, I mean, she hasn't even been able to enjoy two days of being Miss USA, where it's already, oh, she must have some pictures out there or something, right? She's getting the, tra- she's getting the treatment. Yeah, she's getting the treatment. But I think she should come and open the mosque. That's what I think should happen. <laughs> Great. I think she should come and open the mosque. <laughs> yeah, of course, you know, uh, I have to say this. You know, my kind of Dutch people, they probably think uh, she'd be too scantily clad <laughs> to in- introduce a whole... Uh, you know, no sex, please, we're Christians. That, that's their variety. Well, well um, yeah, yeah. But, you know, everybody sort of, you know, they just wouldn't want her to do the the bathing suit part of the contest. They'd want her to do the formal, um, you know, very nice um, evening gown thing. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, I want to uh, shift us again. Um, and, by the way, I want to get back in a little bit to the economics of fear. Yeah. Because um, we need to talk about that. I mean, you know, the, the reality is that for 20 years, um the economic prospects for white males in the United States have been absolutely plummeting, Mm -hmm. mainly with the decline of manufacturing. Um, And I have a hunch that that lurks somewhere in the background here. But before we get to that, you wrote a splendid article, again, for Religion Dispatches earlier this month on Arizona as the new Alabama. I can't quite recall the the title, but... um, I wonder, uh, Professor Butler, if we could talk a little bit about the latest twists and turns uh, in uh, Arizona in respect to um, people of uh, Mexican origin. There seems to be no end to that. Yeah, no, there is no uh, end to it, and it's it's going to be a hard story before it gets better. So, so let me let me talk about that. I think what is the most underreported uh, story, but I think is an important story which is the role of um, one of the state representatives, Steve Montenegro. Now, what's interesting about this is that Montenegro is part of a church called Apostolic Assembly, and that is a oneness Pentecostal denomination. There are probably about maybe a thousand congregations in the U.S., maybe a very small a very small number of people. I mean, I'd say less than 150,000. But Say, the, say the name of it again. Apostolic, so Apostolic Assembly. Apostolic okay. Now, here's what's interesting yeah. about this. Montenegro was um, one of the signers of HB 1070, which is the immigration law. He was also the sponsor of the bill that just got signed about not teaching um, these ethnic things in the schools. And, and um, I'm going to paraphrase him where he says, you know, they're teaching victimology when they're teaching about Chicano studies and things in the classroom. And so we don't want our students to learn about victimology through um, ethnicity, we want them to learn about other things. Now, here's a kicker. Um, what's interesting to me about Montenegro is that he's also um, a national leader within the Apostolic Assembly. He is the uh, vice president of their youth group, and he's also an assistant pastor at his father's church, Sunrise Assembly. Now, here's the thing. Um, Montenegro's family came from El Salvador, and if you put this story together with the asylum story back in the 80s, and I think this is interesting to bring up because lots of people have not paid attention to the fact that um, the asylum issue in the in the 80s that happened was because Ronald Reagan said we're going to offer this and all this. There were problems with this, but a lot of people within um, churches, including Apostolic Assembly, got their citizenship. Steve Montenegro's family got their citizenship by saying, uh, by having people from Apostolic Assembly sign for them. And not only that, they said that they were persecuted. They came from El Salvador. Now here we are, you know, 20 years and change later, Montenegro saying, I don't want to have, um, you know, any kind of amnesty or anything for people who are here. When half of that, a, a good number of Apostolic Assembly people are people who crossed over the border. Some of them now are legal. Some of them now are people. not. Yeah, his own his people. Own people. Yeah. His own people who, he've ta- who he's taken tithes and offerings from. 
So I think he's a very interesting figure in terms of looking at how this is going to play out in religious groups because this this will divide a lot of people, Pentecostals, Catholics, whole bunch of other folks. And this is a story that I don't think is being picked up in the, in the regular kind of press. And Montenegro's place in this is, you know, as one church person put it to me, he's like Haman. He's ready to sell his people off, Right. But, but I think it poses a lot of questions for, you know, not just the denomination, but for how um, other church groups will decide to deal with people who are within their ranks, who think about this immigration law as a good thing. We have that, uh, we have that uh, generationally a little bit in uh, California, mm-hmm. where a fairly significant number of uh, multi-generation families whose origins uh, are in Mexico or elsewhere in, in uh, Central and South America are pretty tough on the newcomers. It's almost like um, we don't want to be we don't want to have our image dragged down. Yeah, or something like that. Exactly, exactly. But I but I think you know in terms of thinking about this from the religious standpoint, it's it's not just an image thing. It's all about what are the benefits that have been afforded to us that we don't want to give to somebody else. Who has co- who's come through the door. So, you know, I, I'd be interested to hear you think about this in terms of, you know, there's, there's obviously a, a liberal stance to this, right, which is this law is wrong. It's wrong to say um, ethnic studies shouldn't be taught in the schools. It's wrong to say that we won't allow, um, we're going to racially profile people, which has been one of the things that, that everybody's worried about. But I, I, I wonder how we might want to think about this in terms of groups that don't pan out so clearly. And, I'm, and think about Pentecostals and others here, who you might find people on both sides of this issue. You know, what do you think is going to happen here? I mean, do you want to speculate? Well, um, in as much as uh, uh, Pentecostalism uh, seeks in all ways to be led by God's spirit, my hope, and I'm not being, yeah. you know, frivolous in saying this, my hope is that the Spirit will speak and that people will uh, understand that uh, in God's eyes, um, you know, the people, have, people aspire to a better life and uh, nobody is uh, illegal, right? And, uh, and the story of God's people is a story, always a story of, uh, of migrants. I hope it breaks that way. Um, I've, I have really know no way of knowing. I mean, the, the problem is that... Um, People get also trapped in this frame uh, of a of a scarcity narrative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which and, is yeah. which is a, you know a different kind of religious narrative than the abundant table narrative for sure. But that's true. It's still religious. Yeah, and I, I'm also wondering too what what this will mean on a you know broader level. I mean, obviously, Sojourners has a has a um, a way of looking at this and and, and um, other groups. And I'm thinking about the uh, National Hispanic Leadership Coalition and, and others. Right. But the way that this pans out, and one of the things I talked about in my article is that they're not paying attention to the fact that you know this will be this will have some polarizing effects. It's also going to have effects on the economics of the state, right? I mean, how do you expect that things are going to happen, or the people who who are there maybe illegally, they don't feel comfortable about coming out anymore. They're not going to feel comfortable mm-hmm. about going to their jobs. They're not going to feel comfortable about anything, and they're going to leave the state of Arizona. And what do you do if you, you know, if you are a church person there and you've got people who are in your congregation who are both for and against this? I see this as being something that's going to be very divisive in in the months to come. And, I, you know, evangelicals and others are not, you know, are not on the same page with this. And so I think we're going to see a split in a lot of religious groups because of this issue of immigration. Right. Right. And... Um I said earlier that there's an economic driver under this for white males in the United States, but really there's an economic driver for all this stuff. Um, I was intrigued by a study that came out last week. Uh, I think Paul Krugman cited it uh, over the weekend in one of his columns, or maybe Monday, um, about the way in which economic anxieties almost without exception worldwide, drive people to the right these days and not to the left. Uh And, of course, I always say that people aren't going to migrate left in the absence of articulation and popular education. Um, But what do you think about that? I mean, uh, um, do you see that pattern yourself? And and do you see it playing, for example, uh, 
in these religious currents about uh, immigration and other issues? Yeah, I do. But part, part of it is about, I think it's an issue for people who feel like things are out of control. I mean, if you're, it's, if, it is about that. Yeah, yep. it's about it's issue about of control. Stability. And so if you move to the right, it's about things will get into place. We can get things lined up. We can, you know, we can stop fiscal, you know, this overspending. We can stop this. We can stop that. But the reality of it is, is that, you know, things move on a fulcrum, right, or this, this sort of pendulum. And they're going to move back and forth. So if you if you take the tack that moving, you know, everything is moving to the right, something is going to tip this back to the other side or tip it back to the middle. And and I think we're, we're entering into this time where it may look like for, especially here, in, you know, politically in the U.S., it may look like for a time that this sort of right thinking is winning. But the problem is going to become that, you know, if you move too far to the right, it's fascist, it's untenable. And then the question becomes is how long can you, can you hold this and how long will the power structure hold it? And I, and I just see too much, fra- you know, there's too much fracturing going on for any of these coalitions to really hold any length of time. I mean, look at, I and mean, I'll, I'll give a good example. I mean, not that this has anything to do, well, that has a lot to do with us in a certain way, but not a lot to do with religion. If you look at what happened just in the, in the UK elections a couple of weeks ago, this, yeah. this whole issue of not being able to, you know, how are you going to have to put together a coalition? These coalitions don't work. You can't get a majority if things are moving so far to the right that there's no, there's no room for consensus. So if you've got real hardliners, you can't move forward. And so I'll, I'll be interested. We're, we're doing this today as, um, you know, right here in, in um, Pennsylvania, we're having uh, um, an election day. Oh, yes, you are. So, Sestak you know, so and, Sestak and um, what's his Spectre. name? So Inspector. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen here? How, how will these things play out in these, in, in these sort of regional elections as we go forward to the midterms in November of 2010? I think what we're going to see is a move to the right. But will that move to the right hold? I don't think it will. I mean, I, I'm willing to put some money down on this right now and say it's only uh, for a season. It's not for it's it's not going to be for any extended length of time. My dear, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna have to bet against you on this because <laughs> if you push things all the way to the right, mm-hmm. I mean, I've said for a long time, and I'm not alone in saying yeah. this. I actually think it'll never be called fascism, of course, but I think no. we're in a position where the threat of what, in essence, is an American mm-hmm. fascism um, is uh, is quite real, um, yeah. quite potentially. Uh, Imminent. I mean, you have this odd phenomenon in the United States where uh, we have a right populism. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we've got all this stuff about uh, 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 the bank bailouts and all this uh, yeah. distress about that, distress about taxes. Um, but it's it's working. It's manipulated by and working for the right. It's a very peculiar kind of puppetry mm-hmm. that you see going on here. No, I agree um, with you on that. Uh, and. That and, you know, the anxiety, the perpetual anxiety about the future of, of whiteness in the United States of America. Uh, we've got a lot of ghosts here that, um, that haunt and, and torment us. I'm, I, uh, I'm a little fearful about the, about the pendulum business. I mean, mm-hmm. at a certain point, the pendulum stops swinging. Yeah. Right? Yeah, or else it breaks. Right? I, I, yeah. Yeah, uh, it breaks. You know, and, 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 and I realize that many, many calming people say, you know, look, we don't have anything like the economic distress that the Germans faced in 1929, 1930. Um, it, it's not like that here. But I'll tell you, the, the festering discontent at people whose, uh, whose livelihoods are, are you know, measurably worse, right? Um, and I was fascinated. I, I, I don't know if I'll write this or not, but uh, I'm really fascinated by the fact that uh, it now appears that the little shoots, little green shoots of growth that we've seen in the economy over the last few months have all to do with the very wealthy spending and with people who hold mortgages that are underwater yeah. stopping to stopping paying their mortgages, and so they're back in the malls using money that they no longer give to their bank. Well, that's <laughs> exactly. Not sustainable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not, you know, it's we laugh, but but um, the the the. Uh, Disappearance. It really is the disappearance of a stable middle class. In the United States has terrible, terrible uh, auspices for uh, for our form of government. I just worry about this. yeah. I, that and I agree with you. But the, the, but the point is, and this is what I think is is the interesting piece. I mean, and, and you are free to you know disagree with me. I think you need a leader. 
if you're gonna be fascist, you need a good fascist leader. And I, yeah, I'm sorry, Sarah Palin ain't in. And no, she's not. She's in. not in. She's not yeah, in. The not question in. becomes: is if you get somebody that's strong enough, who you know, then it then it means real trouble. But right now, I see it as you know these these pockets of discontent. But with no person to lead them forward. Now, if you subscribe to, yeah, I need a leader. This is a populist movement. You know, it, it lasts for for some time. But it needs it needs a coalescing force. And right now, it doesn't have a coalescing force. It doesn't have somebody who can bring all these factions together in certain kinds of ways. They can't bring the independents, the Tea Partiers, all these people who who have this level of discontent. I mean, the only person right now, unfortunately, I think who could probably do it, but he'll never run for office because he's too busy spending his money is Rush Limbaugh. And, and, you know, he does it in, in a terms of, a, um, how do I want to put it, in, in a way that's a media savvy way, right? Or, but it's not, there's, there's no political leadership because most of these guys are either walking the La- Appalachian Trail or doing something else, right? So who, who's it going to be? And that's, that's my bigger question about this not being able to hold this, who, who leads it? Because you, you need somebody. I mean, everybody could get behind George Bush if you're worried about whiteness because, you know, there was George and he allowed, you know, certain minorities like Condoleezza Rice and others because they fit into this mold of, you know, this is the good minority person, right? They act like white people. But there's nobody around right now, you know, on any of these sides who I think is, is even wants to court anybody of ethnicity. I mean, they can't even figure out how to make a coalition that'll, that'll hold together. You know, some of these dis- you know disgruntled, I mean, how many is it today that's running? Maybe 36 black Republicans, somebody, you know, running for office. They can't even hold the, pe- the people of color together in their groups. So how are they going to hold the whole, you know, the whole thing together? Well, you don't necessarily do all of this uh, electorally. I mean, that's it's true that the Germans voted, voted for Hitler. But yeah. if you've got, you think about the um, degree of proto-fascism in the U.S. military, and the yeah. extent of that, and then the sort of the the part of the national security world that is completely out of sight, but it's but it's there. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there there are ways to do this. I, I I agree with you that at the moment there's no obvious uh, leadership for this, but but uh, it doesn't make me sleep any better. No. By the way, wasn't Lou, Lou Dobbs going to make some kind of move in this direction? Oh, well, yeah. I, I don't know what happened to him. I think he's off spending his money somewhere. Maybe he's, he's, he's gearing up for some election race. I mean, he, he used to be this great populist voice, but now he's sort of been replaced by Glenn Beck, you know, and Glenn Beck has the cry on cue thing going real well. So, and, and by the way, Glenn Beck just got an honorary degree you know, from, from Liberty University. Oh, Liberty, so, yeah. yeah. So uh, now, now uh, it's Dr. Glenn Beck, so we're going to have to call him doctor the next time we see him. I'll be sure to do that. <laughs> uh, let me, uh, let me uh, take us in the direction of uh, another uh, fear factor that, in fact, um, could be part of an eventual trigger for an American fascism, and that, of course, is the, uh, the threat of a major terrorist event on U.S. soil. Yeah. We can visit terrorist events on other people's soil, but uh, it, it should never happen to us, right? Exactly, uh, exactly. And, you know, the the Miracle Grow bomber in Times Square has uh, elicited all this uh, interest. You know, initially there was a deep sigh of relief, but now there's, oh, my God, these guys turn so quickly. Mm-hmm. What's the problem? Yeah. Here, here these guys, you know, living in a nice house in the suburbs, and he's... He's, uh, he's got everything. He's got a great. He's got a great job. He's got a wife and kids, and you know, in five minutes, he's back in Pakistan, and then he's planted in a bomb in, in, in Times Square. Mm-hmm. I was. Um, I mean, it's reasonable to uh, to worry about that, obviously. But then we had uh, the Attorney General saying, "You don't have to Mirandize people if uh, if you think they've done a real bad thing," which was kind of interesting because because actually you don't have to Mirandize them anyway under current law. And get the information from them, um, but I, I, underneath this, um, we get back to the myth of American innocence, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, why would anybody be surprised that the real threat of a real serious incident to in the United States has increased since we've stepped up our activity, particularly our drone attacks? AFPAC, as it's called. Yeah, yeah, right. Why would anybody be surprised by that? Well, I, yeah, I think people are surprised in part because they're not paying attention to what's going on. 
in Afghanistan or anywhere else. I mean, this is sort of like the because thing Obama's where, president, right? Yeah, so it can't be so bad. Yeah, well, no, no, it's not Obama's president. It can't be so bad. It's like Obama's president, and it's really bad back here at home. So we don't even have time to think. You know, we only have time to give placate the troops and like we love the troops, right? You know, if you if you if you think like you're on the right, you're going to say. You know, we love the troops. We think about what they're doing they're in harm's way every day, but it's platitudes. It's not a real engagement with the war. And on the left, it's like, oh, you know, this war, we shouldn't be there in the first place, but we got to think about this other stuff. So nobody's paying attention to the fact that the things that we're doing overseas are going to make things increase at home. That's number one. But number two is, I'll, I want to throw another monkey wrench in here. I mean, it, it was interesting to me that we have people who are just homegrown terrorists. I mean, we've got we, we've got two things we, that we have to hold in tension here in this country. One is is that you know you may have people of foreign descent who decide you know my life's not good enough. I need to go back to pa Pakistan or wherever it is and train, or I want to come here and do something. And then we got our folks at home who are disgruntled, who are American born, you know, got their papers and everything else, right? right. And who want to bomb stuff here too because they're sick of the way the government is running right now. So we've got two problems, and, and both of those problems are encroaching in to create some very um, troubling bookends, I think. So I don't think it, we could even just look at this as in terms of, you know, Americans, say, wanting to go and join, join Muslim groups and things like that and, and do jihad. It's also the folks who are nice Christian folks at home who don't mind blowing up things because they're upset. Can you conceive of a scenario in which some of our homegrown terrorists would stage something massive? Duh, um, the Hutari. Attribute it? Yeah, and attribute oh, absolutely. It to, I mean, no. yeah, I just, you know, I was laughing because a couple of weeks ago we had a sort of a street festival here in Philadelphia, and there were a bunch of guys passing out CDs about the conspiracy at 9 11. And that was part of what they said was that this was a homegrown thing and it wasn't about anybody else coming from some other country. And I thought, oh, wow, this is this is really something. So, I mean, if, if you fold all of this this in with the, you know, Christian beliefs about the end times and everybody's beliefs about end times, I mean, no matter what religion you've got, I mean, this makes for a really volatile mix. And what I what I do think our governmental officials don't quite understand Miranda rights or not is that when people are motivated by, you know, sort of religious themes and whether they think it's, you know, we need to bring in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of Allah or anything else. So the, our misunderstanding of these things and the inability to really suss some of these things out will cost us in the end. And I think this is part, this is part of the reason why we're having problems in the war on terror is that, you know, half of the time we're looking for the wrong kinds of things and we're not interrogating the kinds of questions that ne need to be asked to drive people to these things. Right. And isn't it the case um, that religiously the biggest default or, or misfeasance mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call it since the war on terror began uh, remains the fact that people, we don't have that very strong voice that looks at this globally and looks at it deeply ethically yeah. and says, um, you know, why do they hate us? Well, here, here are perhaps some reasons. Here, you know, here are 500 military bases. Here are all these coups that we yeah. still engineer. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, we need, you know, we need to move into that world house that King talked about. I don't. Ha I mean, I know a handful of religious leaders with that perspective, but they're not out there in the public square. They're not saying that in a vocal, dramatic way. Yeah. This has to stop. Yeah, and we don't have those kind of people who are willing to. I mean, when I I try to tell people now, everything is 140 characters, or a 600 to 1,000 word op-ed or blog piece. It's really hard to get at these deep ideas because nobody has the has the, the sort of the listening patience. We are all ADD where, where that's concerned, right? But there's also no sort of. And I don't want to say that we need this. It's almost saying like we need a fascist leader, right? But there's no sorts of moral authorities you can go to. I mean, if you think about, and you can't ask people in the Catholic Church anymore to be your moral authority, right? They've got their own issues of their own, which we'll get to in a sec. I mean, you don't have the same, the, um, liberal Protestantism doesn't have the same kind of leadership. Uh, if we believe Eddie, have the visibility or the... Yeah, oh. yeah if we believe the, um, Eddie Glaude, the black churches did, so it doesn't matter anyway, right? I, I mean, I'm being facetious, but there, there is a dearth of this kind of voice. And it's what I've sort of been thinking about lately is that, you know, since there's no moral voice, does the media serve as a moral voice for us? 
you know, albeit however faint it is, is it that moral voice now instead of, you know, what religion was supposed to serve? Um, it could be, but then again, your point about fragmentation uh, obviously applies in the in the media. The the, the difficulty is that yeah. the that the what I would consider to be the high end media mm -hmm. uh, has greater intensity, but an ever shrinking audience. Um, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a real serious problem. I mean, uh, not that uh, Bill Moyers was the be all end all, but uh, a lot of people have said, "Wow." That's the last person who could take that in a sort of encyclopedic view, yeah, uh, and 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 evaluate the news within that deeper moral frame. Yeah, exactly. There's no Walter Cronkite, right? Right. You know, well, and all he did was read the news. And exactly. Voice, but everybody but still, trusted him. You know, everybody trusted him. Still, people people felt people felt that deep down he was a moral person. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. And he did say some moral things. I mean, it's like you know when he came back from Vietnam, right? You know, this is an unwinnable war. I mean, it's like you know Linda Johnson had to say himself, "If I don't have Cronkite, I don't have anybody." So, I mean, even even he's able to say something to you know the president of the United States. We don't have anybody like that now. You know who says who, who's going to say anything to Obama? The only person that you know shoots back at Obama every now and again is um, Sarah Palin on her Twitter page, <laughs> and and that and that drives me crazy. But I mean, you know, what's that, right? Right, right. Well, Anthea, we're depressing ourselves. We should uh, end this interview on a on a high story, note, <laughs> uh, more 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 more, more joyful <laughs> note, which is uh, we learned uh, this week that uh, bishops in the Roman Catholic Church don't actually work for the Pope. <laughs> I, you know, I love that, right? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, they don't work for the Pope anymore. They're, they're free agents. So, you know, I'm sure none of them knew that, right? Since they have right. to go to meetings that he calls and everything, and every time he calls a sinner, they've got to show up in Rome. But yes, they are they are free to not have to listen to anything he has to say, which I, which I think is a new low, you know, perhaps, in the ways in which the church is trying to tap dance themselves out of um, these um, laws that are proposed in the state of New York and some other places to extend the statute of limitations. This is just craziness. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the bottom line is this. Whether they're free agents or not, or self-employed individuals who probably haven't filed the Schedule C in years. The fact of the matter is, is that um, the church is going to pay. And they can pay now, or they can pay later, and they're already paying later. And they're, they're paying right now. I mean, there's there's no question about this. But you know, the degree of silliness that is coming out now about this, and the and the machinations of everybody running around with the you know, I like to call it the rustling of the cassocks in the papers, is ridiculous. And I don't know if they think they're going to stop the gray lady from looking at them, or people like me from writing about you know this this malfeasance and their absolute. Um, churlishness about children but um you know being self-employed does not negate the fact that the church has responsibilities you know towards those who have been abused and i don't care how they try to get out of it i don't care what kind of new thing they come up with they're not bright enough and they don't have enough money to hire the good lawyers anymore that's just the bottom i line. don't think they've got the best uh, legal minds working for them on this no. one. I, mean, I, I actually had a I, my sister's an attorney and i was i was thinking and she has a Limited liability corporation. I said, I said, what do you think the prospects are? Holy Roman Catholic Church, LLC. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, listen, there, you know, I'll close with this. Here in um, Philadelphia, and I'm going to forget the names. So all the Philadelphians will be upset with me. Uh, the biggest, what used to be the biggest Catholic school in the world is closing. It used to hold at the height of its heyday 6,000 students. The Catholic Church is a is an organization on the skids and in the next 10 years they're going to have more empty buildings more empty churches more empty schools and they will not have the finances nor the insurability to keep up what's going on right now and that is the truth i don't care what they try to do right now if they think about this from just a purely organizational perspective they're toast that's all it is it's the truth and so, it. yeah, it's, 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 it's the biggest problem they've got right now, and they will not face it. I mean, let aside the moral stuff and everything else. If they just want to be immoral, like BP. See, BP, you know, with the oil thing, they can pay out at Infinita because they had profits. The Catholic Church has no profits to pay out from. Yeah. Yeah. Once again, um, 
You don't have to be a Marxist to understand this. Economics is the driver. Exactly, exactly. Well, let's leave it there. This is a, a, a pleasure. It's always a pleasure Absolutely. to review the week's news with you. Yeah. Let's do it again soon. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.